and welcome to the seventh episode of Ask a Physicist. Now, I've just started my holiday, so I should now have plenty of time to tell you about more interesting facts and explanations from the world of physics. Now, uh, a couple of people actually, including uh, Van Boeven here, have asked me about a very interesting topic, namely dark matter and dark energy. And well, since I've actually just finished my revision for a five weeks module on cosmology, I think I should be well in shape to tell you something about that topic. Now, uh, first of all, I'd like to clarify what is meant by dark when we talk about dark matter. Because uh, really, I think there's still quite a few people who get the wrong idea. You see, in astronomy and cosmology, when we call something dark, all that means is that we know there's something there, but we can't see it. In other words, it's an object that is heavy enough for us to notice its gravitational effects, but it does not emit any detectable radiation. Hence, it's dark. You could might as well call it invisible or unseen, really, it makes no difference. Now, uh, the first person to show the existence of dark matter was the Swiss astronomer Fritz Zwicky, a very brilliant man, by the way, who also came up with several other scientific concepts, including neutron stars and supernovas. He also invented the term spherical bastards, which he used to call some of his astronomer colleagues when they disagreed with him. His reasoning behind this was that just like a sphere is round from whatever way you look at it, so they are bastards from whatever way you look at them. Well, um, I suppose he was a bit eccentric, but um, let's move on. Essentially, we have three pieces of evidence to show the existence of dark matter. The first one being the uh, rotation curves of galaxies. Now, uh, I'm sure you're all aware that the Moon orbits around the Earth, just like the Earth orbits around the Sun. What you might not know yet is that the Sun orbits around the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, along with hundreds of billions of other stars. Now, um, at each of these stages, we have an example of orbital motion which is explained by Kepler's laws. Essentially, for any object, for example the Earth, orbiting around a bigger object, for example the Sun, the gravitational force stops the smaller object from flying off and thus provides the centripetal force required to keep it in orbit around the bigger one. Well, um, if the gravitational force was to exceeds the centripetal force, then uh, the smaller object would keep spiraling towards the bigger one until the two collide. <laughs> Whereas if the centripetal force was to exceed, uh, the small object would keep moving away from the bigger one until they both were out of sight. And that would not be orbit. Now, the gravitational force depends on the mass of the bigger object as well as on the square of the distance between the two objects. The greater the mass of the bigger object, the greater the gravitational pull. And um, the larger the distance between the two objects, the smaller the gravitational pull. The centripetal force, on the other hand, depends on the distance between the two objects and the velocity of the smaller object. A greater velocity would mean a greater centripetal force and the larger the distance between the two objects, the smaller the centripetal force. Basically this means that for a planet that orbits closely to the Sun, there will be a very strong gravitational pull and hence for the object to stay in orbit also a very high centripetal force, which in turn means that the planet must move at a relatively high orbital velocity. On the other hand, 
uh, a planet orbiting at a greater distance from the Sun would feel a much weaker gravitational force providing the centripetal force to keep it in orbit and would thus have to move at a much lower velocity. So um, if we plot um, the velocities of planets with respect to their distance to the Sun uh, we would get a curve looking like this. As you can see um, at smaller distances to the Sun um, the velocities are relatively high whereas as we go further away from the Sun they get lower and lower and um, unsurprisingly this is actually exactly what we observe in our own solar system as you see here. Now a curve like this is what we call a rotation curve. Now uh, for galaxies this is a little more complicated. Uh, from what we can see we would assume that galaxies consist to the most part out of stars and dust distributed in a disk-like shape. Also it would appear that the greatest part of the mass of the galaxy is found in the bulge at the center of the disk. Now in spiral galaxies all the stars on the disk are orbiting around the center of the galaxy. As before, we can say that the bigger object, in this case central bulge of the galaxy, is exerting a gravitational pull on the orbiting stars, which provides a centripetal force to keep them in orbit around the bulge at a certain orbital velocity. So we um, could just apply the same relationship again and plot a graph where the um, velocity of the stars falls off as we increase the distance from the center of the galaxy. However, it's slightly different as we get towards the center. Because, um, well, as we get closer towards the center, the orbit of an orbiting star will enclose less and less mass. So essentially, as we get closer to the center, the mass of the central object becomes less and less. And so uh, the gravitational pull towards the center will actually be less and less. And hence, of course, the centripetal force and the velocity of the star also will have to be less. So um, the uh, rotation curves we predict for a spiral galaxy would look more or less like this. So, uh, in other words, we would expect the velocity of stars to first increase as we go further out from the bulge of the galaxy and then fall off as for the velocities of planets in our solar system. Uh, now this is what we predict. Unfortunately what we observe in reality is actually quite different. From observation of our own and other galaxies uh, we can see that the velocities of stars is actually not dropping off as we expect it to as we move away from the center. Uh, in fact, it turned out that once we are past the galactic bulge, it seems that the velocities are pretty much the same everywhere, regardless of how far we move out, thus uh, giving us what we call flat rotation curves, as you see here. This is not at all what we expected, and theoretically, if the stars at the edge of the galaxies were moving at such speeds, their gravitational pull would no longer provide the centripetal force required to keep them in orbit. In other words, the galaxy should be flung apart. Now, uh, obviously they are not. So, how do we solve this problem? Uh, well, the obvious solution is that there just has to be more matter in the galaxy that we cannot see, which provides the gravitational pull required by the stars to stay in orbit. Now this invisible matter, i.e. dark matter, can't just be at the center of the galaxy but it has to be spread around the galaxy so um, that it can affect specifically the uh, stars which are far out in the galaxy. This in turn leads us to the idea of dark matter halos. <laughs> 